Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. Coming up this week, the Pro Cycling Breakaway League that could soon become a reality, as One Cycling is reportedly close to getting 250 million euros of investment. We've also got a lot of racing to look back on, with the Cyclocross Worlds, the Alula Tour, the Etoile de Bessege, and the men's and women's Vuelta a la Comunidad Valenciana. This week in the world of racing, we learned that Matej Mohoric is back. It's just a beautiful sight, so aesthetically pleasing. It's like watching poetry in motion, isn't it? We also learned that Strade Bianche will be longer and tougher than ever this year. Now, the organisers, RCS Sport, have added a finishing loop to both races that adds four gravel sectors. Good choice, or is it a case of it ain't broke, don't fix it? Let me know in the comments section down below. And finally, we learned that the rumoured Saudi-backed cycling Super League is gaining traction. Reuters reported on Friday that SJR Sports Investments, a new company owned by Saudi's public investment fund, is the new frontrunner to back the new league, with a sum of 250 million euros touted as the investment figure by an anonymous source familiar with the matter. Unlike previous rumours of breakaway leagues in cycling, this one doesn't seem to be going away. And as time ticks on, you really get a sense that this one might have legs. Which leads us on to the question of whether or not it would be a good thing for our sport. I'm going to leave the politics and sports washing aside on this and focus purely on the impact it could have on cycling. Uh, for those of you who haven't been keeping up with the story, the concept would be to combine new and existing races, totaling around 100 days, into a new calendar. Uh, this would make for a season-long competition with a guarantee from the teams that most of the world's top riders will attend the majority of those races. The idea is to simplify things for the general public who could more easily understand the narrative of the sport. At the same time, it would allow the teams a piece of the financial pie rather than it going into the pocket of big race organisers like ASO and at the same time helping the smaller races financially through the sponsorship money of the series. Now, I presume that the series of races will be packaged up and sold to international broadcasters so that wherever you are in the world, you'll be able to watch the whole series on one channel or platform in your country, although those details are probably a long way off just yet. Uh, personally, I like the idea. I've said it before, but whilst I do love the season narrative as it is, it is immensely complicated to understand and explain to a non-cycling fan. Take Saturday as an example. I've got my laptop open to keep my eye on what's going on, and my wife Lorraine is asking what I'm watching. Well, to begin with, it was the age category cyclocross races from the World Championships, then it was the Alula Tour, then the Etoile de Bessege, and finally the Vuelta a la Comunidad Valenciana. I guess we can take cyclocross out of this equation, it's a different discipline entirely, but that's still three pro road races all taking place concurrently. Even for a die-hard cycling fan, it's difficult to keep up with. Even for me, whose job it is on a Monday morning to talk about the previous week's racing, it's hard to keep up with. And it means that the world's best riders are spread thinly throughout those races. Uh, the big GC battle we want to see this year, for example, is Roglic versus Pogaccia versus Vinigal versus Avonapol. However, with those riders racing programmes for the season, the only time we're going to see all four of them up against each other in a single stage race is at the Tour de France. And we wonder why that race overshadowed all others by a country mile. As a counter to that, you could say it makes it all the more special when that time does come. It's the big moment that we've been building up to all season long. However, for the greater good of the sport long term, I do think it would be better to see the best rides up against each other more often each year. Now, there would be some consequences of this Super League, of course, should it happen, uh, two of which immediately spring to mind. Number one, we would see a lot of races fall by the wayside uh, in a world where it's already incredibly difficult to finance and organise pro bike races out on public roads. Uh, this could be the final nail in the coffin for smaller, often historic races that are not included in that league. And secondly, it could make it a lot harder for young riders to break through. Already this year, we've had a plethora of young riders winning or making standout performances at top level races. With a cut down calendar and with the promise of teams sending their best riders to those select races, it's not only going to be harder for those young riders to shine, it's going to be hard to even get selected by your team in the first place. So I really hope that the league has plans for the development of young riders and to give them enough pathway to the top of the sport. Anyway, I would love to know your thoughts. Uh, many of you commented on this last time I spoke about it on this show, but maybe your view has changed, or maybe you're only starting to think seriously about it now that this thing looks more of a reality than a pipe dream. Uh, leave your thoughts in the comments section down below. 
Uh, well, it's probably time to talk about the racing now, since there was a lot of it, as I alluded to earlier. Uh, the question is, where do I start? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. The Vuelta a la Comunitat Valenciana. I joke, of course, there was a lot of really good racing last week, including in Spain, where there was a surprise breakaway win on day one and a 1-2 on the stage for VF Group Bardiani CSF fight Zane. A misjudged chase from the peloton allowed the breakaway to fight it out between them for the stage win, and not even this instant hampered those chances. Oh, no, no, no. There goes some of that big buffer. You've got to follow the route, oh, and he's got tied God. up. One of them's got to ride away here and try and take it. Oh, my gosh. That was Manuele Tarozzi and Alessandro Tonelli. The younger of the two waited for their teammate and allowed them the stage victory and the first leader's jersey. I don't think I'd have done that. I'd have been sprinting for my life as soon as I saw Tonelli grappling to get the tape out of his bars. That day was the first descending masterclass of the season for Mohoric, and he was back at it again 24 hours later. It seemed like every rider knew what to expect at the end of stage two. We have seen Matej Mohoric quite active yesterday too. Yeah. Could he try something in descent today because it's a bit more technical, I think? I'm, I'm actually quite sure he will do. <laughs> do you think a guy you know well like Matej Matej Moritz, we try something. Yeah, 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 he's one of the guys that can attack in the descent. Uh, I know the last climb and I think that it's a really good day uh, to Mohoric. Well, it didn't matter that everyone knew what was going to happen. Mohoric rode away from them anyway and cruised to his first victory of the season in only his second day of racing. Sort of edge of your seat stuff, isn't it, watching him descend, but you still can't keep your eyes off it anyway. Uh, it was officially Little Trek Day on Friday, after a win for them in Bessege, which I'll get onto later, and a South African time trial chance for Ryan Gibbons, they took a third win with Jonathan Milan in Spain. Safe to say that the field of sprinters at that race was not the deepest, but Milan was in a class of his own in that sprint. I think a lot of us are really looking forward to seeing him up against the Philipsons and Maliers of this world later on this season. The first GC action came on stage four, but not on the climb that we'd expected. Uh, an amateur cyclist tragically lost their life in an instant near the finish line that morning, meaning that the race had to finish elsewhere. Our condolences go to their friends and family. Uh, the summit of the Miserat climb featured as a new finish, and it was there that Brandon McNulty laid the foundations for his overall victory. The TV camera didn't really catch the moment he went, but footage that later emerged revealed that he'd taken his chance on a flatter section of the climb. Uh, those behind were unable to chase him back, and at the end, he crossed the finish line 12 seconds clear of Butrago and Vlasov. Vlasov did his best to put the American in trouble on the fifth and final stage yesterday, but it was always going to be hard to distance McNulty given his current form, and in the end, he comfortably won the biggest stage race of his career so far. Uh, the big story that day, though, was of another American rider taking his first pro win. Will Barter of Movistar was in the early breakaway, dropped all his companions on the main climb of the day, and then faced an excruciating 45 kilometer solo effort to keep the bunch at bay. The odds were stacked against him, and few believed that he'd survive when watching on, but he did, despite another daredevil descent from Mohoric and a subsequent chase from Lidl Trek for Milan. And how well deserved was that win? Even the disappointment of Jonathan Milan, who finished second, must have been somewhat mitigated with the way in which Barter won. It also made for a very successful race for the USA. Two stage wins in a row and the overall classification to boot. Got to be a long time since they've had so much success in such a short period of time. I did ask Killian, of course, and he said it's the 2020 Tour of Taiwan where this last happened, although on that occasion it was the same rider, Eric Young, who won both stages back to back. However, that race didn't have the same caliber of rides on the start list, so before that, it was the 2018 Colorado Classic. Again, though, that's a race on US soil with a bunch of very motivated home riders, so I reckon this latest one is more impressive. In the women's race, which was a one day held over the same course as the final stage of the men's, there was a similar outcome. Uh, the early break survived, helped in part by a couple of crashes in the bunch that hampered the chase in the closing kilometers. With 30 k's to go, three riders remained out front. Uh, Julie Bago of Cofidis, Caroline Anderson of Live Alula Jaco, and eventual winner, Cedrine Cabal of Ceratizit WNT. Anderson crashed on a corner with around 10 k's to go, taking Bago down with her, and that was that. Cabal held them all at bay to the finish line to take her first pro win outside of France. Speaking of France, let's move on to the Etoile de Bessege now. Uh, with the opening stage cancelled due to farmer strikes, we had to wait until Thursday for the start of the race. But it was worth the wait. There was a brilliant finish that day. Uh, Mass Pedersen was the race favourite and his team Lidl Trek rode for him all day, but he was pipped to the line by under-23 world champion Axel Laurence of Albertson de Koenig. Now you know there's some serious power going on if someone beats Pedersen in an uphill sprint, and handily for us, Laurence uploaded his ride to Strava complete with power data. Uh, here was his power profile for the end of that stage. 
10 minutes at 390 watts, 4 minutes at 484 watts, 2 minutes at 593 watts, and a peak minute right at the end of the race of 673 watts. The future is bright for that lad. Uh, Pedersen made amends 24 hours later by winning the bunch sprint into Bessege, but the sprints were followed the next day by the early breakaway. It happened a lot last week, and this was another feel-good story, because winning from the break was 29-year-old Samuel Leroux of Van Riesel Roubaix. Now, this is a guy that has spent the last nine years racing at continental or club level, waiting for his breakthrough moment. Well, his patience paid off, and that victory would be made even sweeter given the calibre of rider he beat from the breakaway. Stefan Bissiger was second, Dries de Bont third. And so it all came down to the final stage time trial. EF Education Easy Post got five riders into the top seven on the day, but none in the top two. Uh, Mass Pedersen started the day as overall leader and the favourite of the stage in the GC, but it was in the end a very close battle for both. Kevin Vaucalat of Arkea B&B Hotel scorched around the course, beating the previous best time of Alberto Betiol by 14 seconds. Uh, Vorkeland started the day third on GC, 12 seconds behind Pedersen, so it suddenly lumped a lot of pressure onto the day. He did it, but only just. Second on the stage by 10 seconds meant he kept the overall lead by two. So a great start to the season by Pedersen, but Vorkeland continues to impress. He's a quality all-rounder, that guy. On to the Alula Tour then, which had the best sprinting lineup of all the races last week. Uh, yet another youngster, Kasper Van Uden, stole a march on the opening stage, taking his first pro victory for DSM Fermanick. Uh, very impressive, with Grunewagen and Merlier behind him. Stage two saw almost a carbon copy of last year. An incredible display of power by Suren Varenschild of Uno X delivered him the stage win, whilst late attack of Pierre Latour was caught agonisingly close to the line. Brian Shaw was out of the picture on stage three though, caught out when a number of teams lit it up in the crosswinds late in the day. A Malia triumph there in a dominant fashion, and again on stage four, where he got the better of Brian Cocard in the uphill drag to the line. Uh, Cocard was cocksure he'd won that day, but the photo finish showed otherwise. The big GC battle came on the final stage on Saturday with a brutally steep climb near the end of the race. All eyes were on Simon Yates of Jaco Alula, an important race for that team of course, but it was yet another young superstar who emerged that day. William Junior Le Cerf appeared to comfortably follow the attacks of all the big name riders and then made one himself on the steepest section that nobody was able to follow initially at least. Uh, towards the top he was caught by UAE's Finn Fisher Black and a group of four was eventually formed as Raphael Meitke and Simon Yates latched on too. The best placed on GC of that group was Fisher Black and with the chasing group closing in behind Meitke drove it on the front to give him the best chance of overall victory but it wasn't to be for him at the finish. Yates launched his sprint early, but had the strength and speed to take it all the way to the line. In finishing second and taking the six bonus seconds, Le Cerf denied Fisher Black the overall win, which went to Yates. And actually on countback, Le Cerf took second on GC. And the 21 year old is in his first year as a pro rider, and it's already clear he's going places. Uh, just a very quick roundup of some other races before I move on to the Cyclocross World Championships. Uh, Ryan Gibbons did the double in South Africa, winning the road race and the time trial. Uh, but Richard Carapaz couldn't quite achieve the same in Ecuador. He won the time trial, but was pipped by an in-form Jonathan Navaez of Ineos in the road race. Uh, Jefferson Cepeda took third place and also fourth, separated by nine seconds and their middle name. Right, let's talk to Boar, which hosted the World Cyclocross Championships for the first time in eight years at the weekend. I've left it until late in the show to talk about it, mainly because the elite races didn't really, um, well, they didn't really offer a lot of suspense, shall we say. I'm taking nothing away from the winners, of course. They capped off incredible seasons in a dominant fashion. Even if you didn't watch it, you can probably guess who I'm talking about. Fem van Empel in the women's, Machu van der Poel in the men's. Uh, there's not a lot to break down in how the races won. Uh, this was the moment it was won in the men's. And this was the moment it was won in the women's. Barring accident or mechanical, both Van der Poel and Van Empel were pretty much assured of retaining their titles by the end of lap one of their races. And so it proved to be. It capped off near perfect seasons for both of them. 18 wins from 20 starts for Van Empel, 13 from 14 starts for Van der Poel. Still just 22, Van Empel has already taken two elite world titles now, whilst for Van der Poel it was his sixth, one short of the record of Eric de Vlaming. Uh, he's won five times from his last five participations at the race, but he's hinted that he may not be returning to cyclocross next winter. And that's a bit of a worrying prospect for the discipline, particularly as Van Aert and Pidcock have already pulled back their participation in favour of better preparation for the road season. Uh, crowds and TV figures are significantly higher when one of those three, or all of those three, are racing. 
Anyway, back to the racing, and it was a 1-2 for the Netherlands in the men's race. Uh, Joris Neuvenhaus, probably the most improved rider of the season, took the silver medal, and for him it must have felt as good as a win. Michael van Turenhout was the saviour of Belgium on the elite race, preventing a Dutch clean sweep by winning bronze. Whilst in the women's, there was a point where Dutch riders filled the top seven spots. Uh, in the end, they had to settle for just the top four, though. Uh, the ever-consistent Lucinda Brandt took silver, albeit a minute 20 down on Van Empel, whilst Peterson took bronze a further half a minute back. Uh, Zoe Bagstedt and Thibaut Del Grosso were in a class of their own in the under-23s for Great Britain and the Netherlands, respectively. Seems only a matter of time before they're riding for the medals in the elite category. Uh, the race marked the end of a career for local stars Denik Stiebar. He won three World Elite Cyclocross titles between 2010 and 2014 before concentrating on his road career. And it was the venue of his first of those three titles that he chose as his last ever pro race. And it was amazing to see the support and cheers that he got from the home crowd. That must have been very emotional for him that hour. Uh, congratulations on a fantastic career, Zdenek. In other news, as mentioned earlier, RCS have been busy making some changes to Strade Bianche this year. Now, the race hasn't really changed at all in the last 15 years or so, but this year there will be a final lap to be taken in twice. That means that the men's race will be 215 kilometres this year with four extra gravel sectors. However, whilst the women's also has those four extra sectors, the overall race length remains about the same as before. The question then, as I posed before, is should they be tampering with it? Kind of feels like they've been listening to the murmurings about the race being seen as cycling's sixth monument and have decided it needs to be longer to truly achieve that status. I mean, part of that narrative came from me, mainly because I would then get to say I finished in the top 10 of a monument. But I'm actually quite skeptical about the changes. The race soared in popularity in a very short period of time, and I can't think of any other race that managed to do that in such a short period of time. And there must be a good reason for that, i.e. they got the format right first time with all the ingredients to attract a star-studded field and a large TV audience. Time will tell whether adding ingredients is going to make the race even tastier, or whether it's a case of tampering with something that was already nearly perfect. And finally, there is some hope for the Tours of Britain this year. Uh, the races were removed from the UCI calendar after the organisers' sweet spots went into administration, but British Cycling are looking to keep them going this year. Apparently, there have already been some positive conversations with both sponsors and TV broadcasters, so here's hoping. Britain certainly needs those races. That is all then for this week's Race News Show, but I'll be back at the same time next week.